Uh, well, I'm so grateful uh, that you're here and that we're able to think through uh, biblical theology together. Uh, my name is Joshua Griever. I uh, am privileged to teach New Testament uh, and Greek and such courses at uh, Bethlehem College and Seminary. Uh, and I, I, I wanted to start out by saying uh, how grateful I am for all the pastors, particularly in the room. I, I train uh, future pastors, and uh, my aim in that is because I want our churches to be healthy and strong, and I'm convinced that uh, to have a healthy and strong church, you really need a healthy and strong pastor or a team of healthy and strong pastors. Uh, godly, they know their Bible, they minister the word well to others. Uh, so for all of those of you, I mean, I'm glad you're all here, but especially the pastors uh, in the room, uh, I, I think in one sense you're the hero. Uh, so I, I'm so grateful for you, and, and I, I hope that our session today is an encouragement uh, to you to go back and do what the Lord has called you to do well. Well, Dr. Tab has uh, got us rolling pretty well uh, in terms of what biblical theology is, what it is meant uh, to accomplish, and I want to focus uh, today uh, for the next half an hour or so on biblical theology in the Gospel of John. That's a massive topic in its own right. Particularly, I want to focus on two themes in John, and both of these uh, fall under the patterns perfected uh, uh, category that Dr. Tab mentioned. So there's promises fulfilled, there's mysteries revealed, but then that last thing that he said, patterns perfected, I would like to work through two ways in which John shows uh, patterns are perfected in Christ. Uh, and those two ways are temple, uh, and the second way is Passover. So temple and Passover uh, in the Gospel of John. This is a workshop, uh, so I'm going to lecture on the temple part of it, and then uh, I'm going to give you about 10 minutes to work through the Passover side of it on your own. I, I want to give you a chance to uh, interact with those next to you, so you will need a Bible uh, in about 10 or 15 minutes. So I'm going to move on past the QR code, and we'll dive into uh, the theme of uh, temple. And I'll get that bigger for you. All right, uh, I am by no means exhausting what John has to say about the temple or the Passover, but I'm just giving you a taste for the kinds of things that are there uh, in an effort to help us on our way to doing biblical theology uh, the way the New Testament uh, would have us do it. Uh, so first, uh, the temple, you can see some of the key texts there on the screen, uh, places uh, like uh, Exodus and uh, Numbers, uh, Deuteronomy, uh, Joshua. These are uh, different texts uh, that you'll find. Uh, these are uh, key texts that we'll come back to uh, uh, for the Passover also. We don't have all the text on the screen here, but just to give us a running start, the Garden of Eden uh, is where I would uh, uh, like to start with a temple theme. The Garden of Eden is this uh, cosmic uh, temple it's a garden temple, it's the dwelling place of God, and you remember even when Adam and Eve are, are uh, exiled from the garden, the cherubim are there, uh, guarding the way with a flaming sword back to the way of life. So there's a sense in which already you have this theme of sacred space uh, there in uh, the book of Genesis. Uh, moving on to Exodus, uh, you have a text like uh, Mount Sinai there, God is on the mountain, clearly his presence, powerful uh, presence uh, is there on the mountain. It's shaking. It's described as devouring fire, that sort of thing. Moses has a shining face uh, because God's glory is there, which is a temple language, a tabernacle language. Uh, you, you've read the book of Exodus before. There's 15 or so chapters dedicated to just the, the building of the, of the tabernacle, which is shown to be the pattern of what he was shown on the mountain. Uh, and there's all the temple furnishings are there, and the key text uh, is Exodus chapter 40 at the very end of the book where the cloud is there and the glory of God fills uh, the temple. Uh, it's not called the temple, it's the tabernacle there, but it's of a piece. It's that same sacred uh, place uh, where God's glory resides. Uh, shifting forward uh, to 1 Kings, uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, I'm running through the Old Testament at this point, uh, things change. The tabernacle had been uh, 
uh, something that Israel picked up and moved around. Ark of the Covenant was picked up and moved around. Tent of meeting was that sort of thing. But when you get to 1 Kings, finally you have a permanent house. Uh, Solomon builds the temple, uh, and it no longer moves. It is the place, Deuteronomy style, it's the place where God chose for his name to dwell. And it was uh, right there on the Temple Mount uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, 1 Kings 8, 11 uh, 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 connects really well to Exodus 40. So at the end of Exodus, you have, uh, it says, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, but 1 Kings 8, 11 says, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. It's, it's almost verbatim. Uh, so, so you get the sense for, uh, in which, in the Old Testament, you have the Garden of Eden, but then Adam and Eve are exiled from it. But then here with the story of Israel, there, there's a return of the glory of the Lord uh, and all that that means, God in his favorable presence with his people. Uh, and then, of course, you know the story of the Old Testament. Uh, how long does that temple last? Uh, 500 years or so. It's not that long. Um, uh, Israel ends up dividing right after the reign of Solomon into Israel and Judah, the ten tribes up north and the two tribes down south. Uh, their worship practices seem to start to diverge at that point. And then uh, when you get to the, uh, to the writing prophets, especially, you can see the, there's a problem of idolatry uh, both north and south. And uh, one book that shows uh, what, ha- so how does that affect the temple is the book of Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel is an exilic prophet, and he's writing then when the temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and, and his people. Uh, one passage that says this, uh, particularly uh, in Ezekiel, is chapter 10. Uh, Ezekiel 10 talks about the cherubim, the same ones that are there in Genesis 3. Uh, They're there also in Ezekiel 10, and they uh, lift up. You guys know that passage. They've got wheels and eyes and all that, so they lift up. It's very visionary, and God also goes with the cherubim, and it's it's an exile uh, as as in in a sense. It's a self-imposed exile where God is saying, I am leaving this temple. Uh, The glory of the Lord leaves. Uh, Ezekiel 8 through 11 especially tells that narrative, and it's one of the sadder stories actually in the Old Testament where God, God leaves uh, uh, Jerusalem uh, in a visionary way. But if you keep reading in Ezekiel, uh, praise the Lord. Uh, God's not done with his people. Uh, the exile is not the final word. Um, Ezekiel 11 has this little Little promise, I'm going to be with them, Ezekiel 11 says, but then the big promise comes later in Ezekiel uh, chapter 37, uh, where God says, I am going to establish a covenant of peace, which I think is the new covenant. It is an everlasting covenant. And then there's this promise in Ezekiel 37. God says, I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. And you're thinking about in Ezekiel, that's a big contrast from what we saw in Ezekiel 10, where God, it wasn't a forevermore thing, but now there's a, I will have my sanctuary there forevermore. And if you've looked uh, in detail at Ezekiel, you know, the last eight chapters, eight or nine chapters of his book is uh, in some sense just building that out uh, in a visionary way. Uh, Ezekiel 40 through uh, 48 talks about the arrival of God's glory back to his temple. Uh, especially I highlight uh, Ezekiel 30, uh, sorry, 43 and 44. Those are the two big chapters. And, and there's actually the same phrase again. It says the glory of the Lord uh, filled his temple. It's 1 Kings 8, 11, all over again in Ezekiel, but this one's a forevermore temple. So we're kind of left scratching our heads. Uh, what's What's all this mean? It seems like God is promising, when you get to the end of the Old Testament, it seems like God is promising his temple presence and all that that means uh, for, his, uh, for his people. Uh, it's tied to this everlasting covenant of peace uh, that God is going to ratify and bring about uh, for, his, for his people. So to sum up the Old Testament, and I know there's a lot more to say. I'm just kind of sampling what does the temple mean here. Uh, I have A, B, and C there. The temple is the, uh, uh, the manifestation of God's favorable presence. That's, that's one way to say what the temple is. Number two, it's the place of right worship. And number three, it's the place of forgiveness. 
So these are kind of major themes. When we think about uh, this temple idea, the tabernacle, tent of meeting, uh, and then finally the temple, this is where God dwells in a favorable way. Of course, God's omnipresent, right? But, but in a favorable way, his uh, uh, presence that brings blessing to his people, these sorts of things. That's what the temple is the manifestation of. Uh, it's the place of right worship. Uh, uh, the sacrificial system wasn't in Galilee, was it? <laughs> it was there uh, in Jerusalem. It was at the Temple uh, Mount. And Israel had to remember that over and over again. The temple was the place where you came and met with God, so to speak. Uh, and it then, by virtue of, uh, of the sacrificial system being there, it's also the place of forgiveness, uh, it's where you come to God. The worshiper brings the sacrifice, and through his sacrifice, uh, he, he, he com uh, comes to God. Okay, so I'm summarizing uh, the major ideas here. Uh, the texts in John that we're going to look at that I think are picking up on these themes are primarily in John 1, 2, and 4. Uh, there's other texts that we're going to look at also, but those are the main ones. Uh, so John chapter 1 um, Dr. Tab actually cited this verse a little bit ago, 114. It's a great place to start the word, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his what? His glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, the word dwelt uh, there uh, is the verb form uh, for the noun, tabernacle. So sometimes maybe you've heard it even preached, he tabernacled among us. That's the, that's the same word, right? So his presence, Jesus as the word with his people is described as a tabernacling presence with his people. I don't think that's a throwaway phrase. It's not just any dwelling. It's a tabernacle dwelling with his people. Uh, and also he has glory in that verse. And it's not just any glory, but it's the glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth, which I think there's a connection there to, to Sinai. You have a couple of verses later, the law was given through Moses. I think that's Sinai on the brain there. Grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. It, it, it actually re reminds us of Moses' uh, uh, ask, please show me your glory in Exodus 33 and then 34, and God uh, does show him his glory by proclaiming his name. Uh, the grace and truth there in John seems to be pretty closely related uh, to the proclamation of God's glory to Moses. My point is that it's in Jesus that you see this. He is the one that's, that's got the glory, uh, so to speak. Another passage is in chapter 2, uh, where Jesus changes the water into wine. You guys all know uh, that story. Uh, we're given a little bit of an interpretation. Why, why John, uh, are you telling us this story? And in 2.11, uh, it tells us, well, he did this to manifest his glory. This was the first of his signs. Uh, all of his signs manifest his glory. But John tells us, when you see a sign in the Gospel of John, it is a manifestation of the glory of God uh, in the Son. And uh, tied with John chapter 1, I think this means that all the signs together in John's Gospel tell us, who he is. They authenticate his mission. They authenticate his identity. They are the works that testify to who he is that we should uh, believe in his name. And, and thus, if we tie the glory language of the signs in John's gospel to the glory of chapter 1, which we talked about a moment ago, then I think the idea is uh, we should see the signs testify that Jesus is the tabernacling presence of God with his people. That's what the signs tell us to believe. They manifest. He is the glorious one among us. He is God incarnate among his people. Uh, another text uh, there on the Jesus as the temple uh, uh, 2a there is John 2.21. And this is the easy one. I feel like uh, John just uh, probably didn't have to say it this way, but he really makes it crystal clear when he gets to chapter 2.21. You know, this is the... Uh, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up again and the Jews are left scratching their heads. How are you going to do this? It took 46 years to build this temple. And, and then John, the narrator, in, he, he inserts, now he was talking about the temple of his body, right? And it was, sometimes we need that, don't we? When, when we read the Bible, we're not close readers, we're not attentive. John really, he, he picks the fruit for us uh, there. Jesus is talking about himself as the temple, 
I, again, I think that fits with chapter 1. The tabernacling among us is said now explicitly that Jesus is the temple in our midst. And it's tied directly there in chapter 2 to his death and resurrection because he says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up again. So, so there's something about the, that Jesus is going to be the temple for us if he goes through with his mission to die and, and rise again. Uh, I do think this sort of language is why Paul later in Colossians will say that in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Isn't that saying much the same thing as John 2.21, that, th- that his body is the temple. So in him dwells all the fullness of the deity. Uh, another text uh, uh, John 12, 20, uh, 12, 41, this is much later, uh, about the halfway point of the Gospel of John, uh, we have a quote uh, of both Isaiah 53 and Isaiah 6. And uh, there John says, uh, John, uh, uh, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory. And John is putting Isaiah 53, which is about the death of the servant, and his resurrection, and Isaiah 6 together. Isaiah 6, of course, is the place where Isaiah himself sees the glory of God, the train of his robe is filling the temple and all that. But my point is that that's a clear testimony to Jesus as God incarnate. He was the one with glory filling the temple that Isaiah saw. So, again, I think there's a link there between Jesus as the temple Jesus as the glory of God in our midst. Okay, the second thing to note there under 2b is that therefore, Jesus is not only the manifestation of God's favorable presence, but he also is then the place of right worship. This is a big question that the Samaritan woman has. Remember, they talk about a number of things, don't they, at the well that day? But one of the things that they talk about is where is right worship? Remember, she says, we, we Samaritans, we worship on Mount Gerizim. Yes, yes, yes. You Jews, you worship in Jerusalem. And so, 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 so it's a question of where is proper worship. Now, Jesus, Jesus does this, doesn't he? He has his cake and eats it too. In one sense, he says, you're wrong. Mount Gerizim was never the appropriate place for worship. He affirms the Deuteronomy principle that God chose Jerusalem. God chose Jerusalem for the place where his name was going to dwell. He says in John 4, uh, uh, verse 20, no, I'm sorry, verse 22, uh, uh, you worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. So, so he doesn't just say the Samaritans knew as much as the Jews and everything was fine and dandy. No, 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 you're, you're ignorant, Salvation is from the Jews. Jerusalem's where it's at, so to speak. So he says that. But then notice, he says, but the hour is coming. Do you hear that language? But the hour is coming and is now here. Ah. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, yes, there was a time when Jerusalem was the proper place for worship and not Mount Gerizim. So that was, the Samaritans were never in the right from that standpoint. But then he shifts. This can only be true if the Messiah has come. He shifts and says, the hour is now here. It's not just the hour is coming. The hour is coming is eschatological language. It's kind of end time language. But he says it's now here. And it must be tied to his coming, which the very next part of the conversation moves to, well, what about Messiah? And he says, I who speak to you am he. So in other words, when the Messiah comes, things are different from the standpoint of where proper worship is to be found. And of course, if we keep reading the Gospel of John, how how do we worship God in spirit and in truth in the Gospel of John? And the answer is tied to by faith in his name, right? Right? It's by faith in the name of Jesus that we have eternal life and we are with God then. I mean, this is definitely what Paul is thinking later in the New Testament when he can call the churches, churches, right? The temple. How how does that work? It's because of the coming of Christ. 
My point is that John 4, you don't get John 4 if John 1 and 2 aren't true. You see, only if Jesus is the temple in himself can you have this shift to so it's not the mountain anymore, right? You, 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 you see the turn in John 4 at that point. Uh, the last thing I'll note in John, and then I'll give you a chance to practice on uh, Passover, uh, is that Jesus is the place of forgiveness then. I want to tie together in John's gospel, how come Jesus can say, no one comes to the Father but through me? How come he can say that? I mean, for a lot of reasons he can say that, but it's, I, I want to tie that kind of a statement to his being the temple, right? Because remember our Old Testament study a moment ago, you couldn't just go anywhere to be forgiven. You needed to go through the sacrificial system at the temple to find forgiveness. This is rather clear in the Old Testament. So, so how does that work in the New Testament now that Christ has come? And he can say, come to me and I'll offer you forgiveness of sins. I am the only mediator between God and man. Those sorts of sayings are quite frequent uh, in John's gospel. His name alone saves. How does that work? It's because he's the temple. He is the final definitive temple that greater than uh, what we saw in the Old Testament. I think this is in chapter 151 already, uh, where you have you know, Jacob's ladder. You have that uh, little enigmatic story where the angels of God are ascending and descending on the Son of Man. I think you see that uh, there's an indication there that Jesus is Bethel. You know, he's the house of God, and he's the means to God, right? Because the angels are ascending and descending on him. So already in chapter 1, you have the sense that no, one, no one's getting to God apart from this guy. Uh, again, there in chapter 10, uh, Jesus says pretty uh, clearly, I am the door, I am the gate uh, for the sheep. So if you want to if you want to be in the sheep fold, uh, which is the people of God, uh, then you have to come through me. And of course, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and I think therefore the life. No one comes to the Father but through Jesus. Uh, all of those things are true because Jesus functions as the place where forgiveness is found. Um, so this is glorious. This is uh, wonderful for our people to hear. Uh, if you've had me in class before, I know some of my students are in the room, I do like asking the so what question. You know, I don't just want us to take biblical theology and say, oh, that's neat. Oh, that's fascinating. We, we can't just be fascinated in an unhelpful way. We need a, we need a so what about this. And I think uh, Dr. Tab was saying earlier how edifying, oops, well, whatever. Uh, <laughs> so we, the point is our people and our own hearts, don't we? We need to know that Jesus is a sufficient Savior. This really undergirds our faith in Jesus to save us to the uttermost. He is the definitive uh, temple. He is the final one that we need, uh, the final sacrifice, the great high priest, like Hebrews makes clear. Uh, so we, we do worship in spirit and in truth, and we need to believe that that's true because that belief is undergirded by who Jesus is, uh, his, his identity and his mission. I, I know all of us are in the same boat. Our people are in the same boat. Uh, in one sense, we've, we struggle to the day we die with legalism. We struggle with the I still sin, I still rec uh, a wrestle with my sin. Am I really reconciled to God? How, how can I know uh, that I'm saved? These sorts of questions are, I think, ubiquitous uh, throughout the church. And these sorts of biblical theological truths that find their climax in Jesus really helps. It's, it, it's a comforting message uh, for uh, Christian and then, of course, non-Christian uh, alike. All right, let me uh, stop there and uh, turn us over to our groups I think you're going to have to come and enter in the magic stuff. <laughs> Thanks. All right, you guys have a handout, uh, hard copy, maybe digital also. What I want to do uh, for the sake of time here is I, I'm going to give you only 10 minutes. 10 minutes, all right? I'm going to try to start and stop right on time. Uh, so here's what I want you to do. You need to get in groups of at least four, maybe five people, because if you're looking at the handout, there are five questions for the Old Testament in Passover and five questions for the Passover in John. So here's what you should do. You should assign one person in your group 
to answer one of the questions. If you have a group of five, that's perfect, right? If you're only four, that's fine. Uh, so you're not going to have time to, if everyone goes to every text, right? So assign one person, you take that question, you take that question, and then, and then report out what's the answer. Uh, I'm just mainly looking for observations at this point. I'm not looking for any like amazing insights, just what does the text say? Uh, and then spend, you know, five minutes on that first part and on the uh, second half of the handout, if you turn it over on the back side, uh, then spend the other five minutes. I'm only giving you 10 minutes, right? Five minutes for the first part, five minutes for the second, and see, and it, then reassign. Uh, you take that question, you take that question, you take that question. And then I'm going to have us report out on each individual question, and we'll go pretty quickly at that point. Are there any questions about uh, what I'm looking for here? All right, you don't have to answer the questions at the bottom, the application questions, because we'll do that when everyone reports out, and, and, and uh, we'll finish our time then. All right, 10 minutes. I am sure that you could have had a lot longer than what I just gave you. Uh, I gave you one minute per question, if you were doing the math. So look, this is a little workshop, and if you didn't get it done, that's okay. The, the point is... Uh, to get us all moving in similar directions here. We want to read the Gospel of John as he's meaning for us to read it in light of, in this case, the theme of the Passover. So I'm going to call on this side of the room to start us out. So this side of the room, you wait, that I'm coming to you. Uh, and just someone then from this side of the room, we're going to start at the uh, first part here and just answer whoever you were who had number one. Don't be bashful. What did they eat when they celebrated the Passover? Lamb, yeah, and and unleavened bread. Okay, good. And herbs. Got to get the herbs. Uh, also, number one, how does the Passover relate to Israel's exodus? Say what? The beginning. The beginning. Good. Huh? Yes, they had to eat in a hurry. Yes. Unleavened bread Fit, uh, fits with that. Lamb, there was no escape out of the, the lamb had to be killed. Yes, that's right. So the lamb's uh, blood is over the doorposts and uh, lintels of the houses, and then, the, and then they can uh, escape. Uh, they are passed over, right, is thus the name. Oh, there's so many different things we could say there. There's one text, uh, w one verse uh, particularly that says that uh, God judges the gods of Egypt uh, there in Exodus 12. That's part of the Passover uh, for sure is a culmination of all those plagues. All right, number two, still over here. Number two, uh, who was commanded to eat the Passover? Uh, those who are circumcised. Anyone want to add anything to that? Basically the Israelites, right? Uh, you had to be circumcised. Yeah, I mean, at the end of uh, Exodus 12, they're, they had to be circumcised, right? Maybe I'm misremembering that, but I think it's a real strict requirement. Okay, okay. They had to be insiders, I think is the point. Uh, why were the lamb's bones not broken? This is a little bit more interpretive. Did you guys come up with anything there? Okay, unblemished, right? Got perfect, unblemished, that's, that's good. Say that again. Yes, that's coming on the next page. John means us to catch that. Uh, good connection there. Okay, uh, number three. Now let's come over to this side of the room. In the promised land, at what location did Israel need to keep the Passover? At the place the Lord will show them. Right? Deuteronomy 16 is really clear on that. So does that mean they could celebrate the Passover just anywhere they wanted to? just at the place the Lord would show them, right? So there's, that's a bit of a prediction there. Uh, also, uh, over here, number four, what might be some reasons we're told that Israel celebrated the Passover as soon as they entered the promised land? You hear, see that in Joshua chapter five. Yeah? Because the land is going to be the now, not, not manna from the sky, but the promised land. You want to enter the land. Yes. You need your sins covered. That's right. So uh, the Passover introduces their life into the wilderness, right, initially, but that's manna. And then you have the re-celebration of the Passover introducing the life in the land with the cessation of manna. So there's a, like a bit of a restart maybe at that point. Anything else on that point you guys want to add? 
Yeah. And that's, I think, one of the big purposes of the Passover. It's a commemorative, it's a memorial is what it's called. It's a memorial uh, uh, festival to remember what God has done to bring us this far. We're on the cusp of the land, and we want to remember that redemptive act. Good. Uh, all right. I'll open this up for any side of the room now. Number five, how often did Israel celebrate the Passover in the Old Testament? Five times? You got it, yeah. Not often, right? Now, part of the reason I asked that question was I think when we do biblical theology, it's, I mean, it's, this is good to just go from Old Testament to New, but in some ways we're better off if we want to see the escalating effect, uh, effect of, of Jesus when he shows up. There's a bit of a need for us to see the brokenness of the Old Testament, and then we see against that backdrop the, the glory of Christ. They hardly ever celebrated the Passover, right? And those, those texts, you can go to them on your own. 2 Kings 23 is a real downer text, you know? And uh, I didn't give the uh, uh, Chronicles text. There's, uh, Hezekiah is one, but his is even only partial. It's not until Josiah and his reforms that then you kind of like get a full-on Passover like we really were hoping for. Josiah! That's like way far in the Old Testament story, right? Almost right before the exile. So I asked the question, why do you think the biblical authors comment on the infrequency? Especially I'm asking the king's author this. Why? Why do we care that they didn't celebrate this much? Any answer that you have? This is just an interpretation, but yeah. I, I, I think that that's it. So here's one indicator of Israel's unfaithfulness. Uh, uh, they, aren't, they aren't commemorating <laughs> what the Lord has done for them. They aren't remembering, right? And I think that's going to tie into Christ because when Christ comes as the true Passover uh, lamb, I think that changes. That does change. All right. Well, we're skipping the summary. Uh, let's do these all together because I'm not sure that everyone got <laughs> all these done. Uh, so if you got number one done on the Gospel of John section, answer it. How does John the Baptist witness to Jesus, point to Jesus as the fulfillment of the Passover? Good, behold the Lamb of God. I, I think there's a pretty clear Passover uh, reference there. There's, you know, commentators ask questions like, does John know what he's saying? John the Baptist, not John the Apostle. But does John the Baptist know what he's saying? And it's like, in one sense, he could be speaking better than he knows, right? The point is, in the Gospel of John, I think we're meant to see that as an up-and-running Passover lamb uh, reference. All right, number two, why does John tell us that it was at the time of the Passover that Jesus cleansed the temple? Any answers? Yeah. Jesus for purification. He's like harking back and saying, hey, this is an important time. And here we are again, Jesus having to do the word, but this time it's going to be perfect. That's, that's good. You know, John has these little narrative asides is what sometimes people will call them, you know. He's like throws in, now it was the time of the Passover. And we're left wondering like, why do I need to know <laughs> that it was at the time of the Passover that he cleansed the temple? And, and, and that actually fits in really with the next one also. Why, why, do, why do we care that the bread of life discourse was uh, there, there in John 6, he feeds the 5,000 bread of life. And that was at the time of the Passover. Why, why do we care? Did you want to jump in? I was wondering if there's a link between unleavened bread which has to cleanse out sin, and here he is cleansing out sin in the temple, right? Yes, I, I, I think that fits with the purification comment a moment ago, the, the, the cleansing. I also think, though, that there, I mean, in John 2 especially, since he says destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again, he's tying that cleansing to his death and resurrection. So the cleansing of the temple is a sign act, right, of the actual cleansing uh, the washing of water that comes through his death. So that's good. Well, I, I think the same sort of thing we can say with John 6. You have the Feast of Unleavened Bread there also. Passover and that feast go hand in hand uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, the manna reference is there too. My point is that John is telling us this is linked with Passover in asking or in saying, now this was at the time of the Passover that he said this and did this. Um, We'll skip Caiaphas' prophecy just for the sake of time. Uh, you mentioned just a moment ago, 
I don't know your name there about the bones not being broken. You know, John 19, here, John 19, 33 through 36, he doesn't say explicitly, Jesus is the Passover lamb. <laughs> but if you know Exodus 12, and it's mentioned again in Numbers 9, then I think it's a clear takeaway that Jesus is shown on the cross to be the Passover, the unblemished Passover lamb, uh, to bring final judgment on the devil and his hordes, like you see in John, and salvation. Uh, the, the, the redemptive act happens on Good Friday so that it is finished uh, comes. All right. I say then, uh, summarize the ways in which Jesus fulfills and transcends the Passover, because I think when we talk about biblical theology, we need to see how Jesus is greater than. How is he greater than Passover? How is he greater than the temple? And I think it's not hard to see. Uh, Jesus, in one sense, he's greater than the Passover lamb because he's not the animal, so you get that. But also, Jesus' people keep the Passover in a way that Israel in the Old Testament didn't. So his effective sacrifice is more effective, so to speak. Uh, his redemptive act is more effective for the people of God than the Passover lamb's sacrifice was. So you get the greater than at the, at the effectiveness. Uh, his blood uh, cleanses our hearts um, uh, as opposed to the Passover lamb's blood, which merely exited them from Egypt. You can see a lot of these themes like temple and Passover. Actually, they kind of work together, don't they? They go hand in hand. And your job as pastors is to tease that out uh, for your people. I'm going to skip the application questions. I'm looking at the time. I think I better end. But I do want to say, get to this point in your ministry. Uh, apply the work of Christ, greater temple, greater Passover. Apply these things to your people. Apply them to your own hearts. These things serve systematic theology, don't they? They do help us understand, in, in my case, the doctrine of salvation. So, soteriology is is informed by and undergirded by our, the way in which we understand Jesus as the greater temple and the greater Passover. So I want to encourage you, don't just put this on the neat shelf, the that's fascinating shelf, but wow, this really is life-changing and undergirds the doctrines that I'm preaching, I'm sharing with others, and my own uh, Christian life. So thank you so much.